touch-me-not. Touch-me-nots are little orchid-like flowers that have a fat seed pod and the way that they propagate is if an animal comes by and brushes that mature seed pod it explodes and throws the seeds out. So that's what the reference in this poem is to the flower touch-me-not. Touch-me-not. I have to fight in myself the desire to put down the pen and go outside where the tufted seed-heavy grasses float on the slow river of August. When a poem touches on the act of writing, it breaks the dream. That's why this one opens as it does, defensive, already split between wanting to know where it's going and wanting not to know. I lie down under the sketchy canopy of the field with my face close to the cellar smell of earth where the white shoots gleam doubled up in the dew in their little preserve. I'd rather watch the bees work the wild flowers than follow the cursive tracks wherever it is they go. Something Maybe the soul says language is a whip that hurts it, slicing open the still-forming, sky-colored chicory flowers, leaving the flayed stems to say what the truth is. I'd rather listen to the brook, its words always garbled just out of earshot. It's not the words themselves that scare the soul but their unearthly gleam, the gleam the pallbearers follow, first to the church and then to the hole in the ground. One day, what has always been true will no longer be true, just like that. If this were a poem about my own death, I'd know how to make the rasp and honey of the August field take on that meaning. And I'd rest for a while in the image of my body married to the black, beloved dirt, the microbes, the rains, the weed seeds sending out their slender filaments of root. But it's not my death that's set like a steel trap at the end of the poem. It's the earth's, upon whose body I lie, and toward whom the ant trails of ink all lead. This world has always been widow and widower, the one we leave bereft when we slip into the place without sunlight, without leaves. Now what has always been true is no longer true. I want to lie down and swim in the shade with the trout lilies to avoid saying it. The earth, as it has always been, is saying its goodbyes. Another world will overrun the emptiness, but I love this one. I let it hold me longer than I mean to the feather leaves of yarrow, the vetches, frail tendrils, and the spotted touch-me-nots, which give such an intimate response if you touch one of the tiny swollen pods, faintly striped, fat in the middle, and containing a tense spring, an unspiraling release that flings the seeds in all directions. I touch and between my fingers, the miniature violence spends itself. Like the seeds, I'm propelled toward some future field, which glows from far off like the idea of plutonium, immortal and alien. When I hear the wind taking leave of the stricken trees, the beaches, 
the birches, the red spruce, or the wet rag on glass sound of the Phoebe in her nest of lichens under the eaves. When I walk in the fern's green perfume or lie with my face among cool roots and sprouts all intertangled and doomed, I'm imagining what will happen to the soul in me which feeds on these things and which I fear will go on living after the loved world dies. I used to live in Princeton, New Jersey, just outside of New York City, and taking the train, one road through what was once a beautiful marshland and now is completely polluted and corrupted by the great oil repositories and refineries there. So this poem is, is set in that landscape. City Animals Just before the tunnel, the train lurches through a landscape snatched from a dream. Flame blurts from high up on the skeletal refinery, all pipes and tanks, then a tail of smoke. The winter twilight looks like fire too, smeared above the bleached grasses of the marsh and in the shards of water, where an egret the color of newspaper holds perfectly still, like a small angel come to study what's wrong with the world. In the blonde reeds, a cat picks her way from tire to oil drum, hunting in the petrochemical stink. Row of nipples, row of sharp ribs. No fish in the iridescence. Maybe a sick pigeon or a mouse. Across the Hudson, Manhattan's black geometry begins to spark as the smut of evening rises in the streets. Somewhere in it, a woman in fur with a plastic bag in her hand follows a dachshund in a purple sweater, letting him sniff a small square of dirt studded with cigarette butts. And in the park, a scarred Doberman drags on his choke chain toward another fight, but his master yanks him back. It's like the Buddhist vision of the beasts in their temporary afterlife each creature locked in its own cell of misery, the horse pulling always uphill with its terrible load, the whip flicking bits of skin from its back, the cornered bear woofing with fear, the fox's mouth red from the leg in the trap. Animal islands without comfort between them, which shall inherit the earth? Not the interlocking kittens frozen in the trash. Not the dog yapping itself to death on the 20th floor. And not the egret fishing in the feculent marsh for the condom and the drowned gun. No, the earth belongs to the spirits that haunt the air above the sewer grates the dark plumes trailing the highway's diesel moan, the multitudes pouring from the smokestacks of the citadel into the gaseous ocean overhead. Where will the angel rest itself? What map will guide it home? Horse. I've never seen a soul detached from its gender, but I'd like to. I'd like to see my own that way, free of its female tethers. Maybe it would be like riding a horse. The rider's the human one, 
but everyone looks at the horse. <laughs> Decade. I had only one prayer, but it spread like lilies. A single flower duplicating itself over and over until it was rampant, uncountable. At ten, I lay dreaming in its crushed green blades. How did I come by it? Strange notion that the hard stems of rage could be broken, that the lilies were made of words, my words. Each one I picked laid a wish to rest. I mean, killed it. The difference between prayer and a wish is that a wish knows it will be a failure even as it sets out, whereas a prayer is still innocent. Wishing wants prayer to find that out. Cocktail music. All my life, a brook of voices has run in my ears. Many separate instruments, tuning and playing, tuning. It's cocktail music, the sound of my parents in their thirties, glass lined, ice bucket, loaded and reloaded, but no one tending bar little paper napkins, cigarettes, kids passing hors d'oeuvres. It's drinking music, riffle of water over stones, ice in glasses, rise and fall of many voices touching, that music, husbands grilling meat, squirting the fire to keep it down, a joke erupting, bird voices snipping at something secret by the bar. It's all the voices collapsed into one voice, urgent and muscled like a river, then lowered as in a drought, but never gone. It's the background. When I lift the shell to my ear, it's in there. This one is called Savin Rock, which was um, an amusement park on the Connecticut coast. And it used to be, in the last century, a kind of glamorous place where couples danced to live bands in the evening and so forth. But by the 50s had degenerated into a sleazy kind of a carnival with many shady characters. Um, it was a place my father took the children regularly. Seven Rock. What I know is a slur of memory, fantasy, research, pure invention, crime dramas, news, and witnesses like the girl who liked to get high and the one who was eventually returned to her family unharmed. The rest I made up. The fathers drank beer in the grandstand, flattening cans and dropping the dull coins into the underworld. It was daylight. We went right under, down into the slatted dark, the smell under the bleachers where lots of men peed, paper cones and dead balloons, people jostling and whispering. Down there were the entrances to the dark rides, the fun houses, Death Valley and Laugh in the Dark. Of course, that's not true. They were right on the main boardwalk, under strings of bulbs lit up all night. Mom says, to remember something, go back to the place where you forgot it. But the place was torn down 40 years ago. 
There are motels there now, where the Ferris wheel lurched up and over the trees, over the fathers at their picnic table, close enough to feel the tilt-a-whirl's crude rhythms through the ground. They make the cars go faster or slower, depending. After hours, the boys loosen up the machines and take girls for rides. Hey kid, I flipped a coin in my head and it came up tails. Want to take a walk? He looked older than our parents. How old did our parents look? He was 50 or 30. I remember the smell of whatever he put on his hair and the blue nail on his thumb. He could flip a lit cigarette around with his lips so the fire was inside. I rode a little metal car into laugh in the dark to dance with the skeleton, possibly real since some teeth had fillings that flung itself at me from the dark. A dog watched me from a pickup window. The world's biggest pig lay beached on its side, heaving. The tattooed lady had a tattooed baby. No one ever tattooed a newborn child for real, did they? The Chinese dragon was only an iguana. The go-kart man asked me if I wanted a little on the side. I said no. His friend in the bleachers blew me a kiss. In the maze of mirrors, I was fatso and skeleton, skirt blown up by a fan. Not true. A fan blew a girl's skirt up. It wasn't me. I was a tomboy. I wore pants. At the stable, girls in love with horses visited and groomed and fed them daily. For girls, it was about trust, being part of a couple, the horse and the girl. But for the man in the barn, it was about making girls feel groomed and visited. Come on over here. Didn't a guy ever brush your hair with a curry comb? I don't believe it, not once. Little honeycomb like you. And kittens, always good bait. A little dish of spoiled milk. Do you think they don't pass them around? They pass them around. Marked kids get shared little pink kid tongue lick, lick, licking like a puppy. Good dog. And on the carousel, a man appeared from nowhere to help her on, hand palm up on the saddle just as she sat, squirming there until the horse pulled her away. Little cowgirl, giddy up. Thus she became half human, half animal and remained so her entire life. Now a shepherdess, now a sleek young she-goat, so lithe and small-hipped, half tame, little goatskin haunches, hand fed on snow cones and cotton candy. The girl who was eventually returned to her family unharmed. Tell me, little shepherdess, how this bodes for first love, the centaur pissing outside your tent in the afterlife, having come down over the stony pastures to claim you and feed you trout and fiddleheads and take you to bed on the high ledges where the wind holds you down for him. But he won't be the first sweet sharp bouquet of darkroom, holster with toy six-gun, 
hot umbrella lamps nudged into place by his fat pink fingers. A little maraschino light presides over negatives hung up like game to dry. The tomboys showing her rump, hard little buttocks under the tender wrapping, the skin, little wonton. Um, I grew up in the Adirondacks here, which is the last great wilderness east of the Rockies. And I would say that of all the influences on my work and on my formation as a human being, that was the most significant. I grew up at least part of every year in real wilderness. And my parents' marriage was um, one of those uh, old New England covert wasp wars. And um, my solace was nature. I would even go so far as to say that nature was my god. In nature, I found a kind of perfection and a kind of steadiness, even though it was wild and brutal, it was fair. Um, even though it was random, it felt fair to me. It felt truthful, as opposed to the convoluted and uh, stultifying um, battles, mental, not physical, but, but the emotional and mental battles that, that ruled the household in which I grew up. And as for my identification with the natural world, from very early on, I had a, a dominant fantasy that I was, in fact, able to speak to animals and that I could understand dogs when they spoke and cats and other animals. And I prided myself on knowing the animal languages. Um, and I felt like an animal myself. I felt more like an animal than like a human child. And actually that figure of the, the half animal, half human occurs fairly often in my work, um, unconsciously at first. And then as I looked back over a period of years, saw that it was in fact a kind of archetypal creature, moi, <laughs> at, uh, developing um, with, with as it says in one poem, a girl with dog blood in her veins. So there always was that from the beginning, that identification with animals. And I think animals were also an escape from human pain. They had their own griefs, but they weren't the same as, as the ones that were afflicting me.